And then um, a little bit about um, in the fourth century, Constantine comes to power and he begins to pay for and, pro and patronize the rebuilding or the building of churches and the rebuilding of churches all over the empire. The first one is actually not one of Constantine's churches, it's, but it's one of the first ones described in 315. This bishop of Tyre by the name of Paulinus was able to build a building and it is compared by the historian Eusebius to the building of Solomon's temple. And then, really far more interesting, and is actually wonderfully illustrated in some of the images next door, Constantine and his mother, Helena, um, begin the process, it depends on which historian we read, of rebuilding Jerusalem as a Christian shrine. The first thing is to discover where it was that Jesus was really buried, and then close by would be where he was crucified, and Helena, according to the stories, finds the true cross, Constantine, they find the true tomb, and Constantine builds this holy sepulcher, the Anastasis Rotunda, the, the space over Christ's tomb, and the church with the place of Golgotha, where Christ was crucified. Um, and we know where it was. It was where Hadrian had a temple to Juno, or to, actually to Venus, I think. Um, but they begin to think of it as New Jerusalem, okay? The space where this was put. So this is just a, a model of that. Um, it doesn't exist anymore. Obviously, what's and the Holy Sepulchre now is from the Middle Ages. It was after the destruction of the Arabs and the rebuilding several times, but this is what we think Constantine's uh, building may have looked like, the big shrine over the tomb of Christ in the center, and then right here, you see this rock with the cross at the top? That's supposed to be Golgotha, okay? Now, if you know in Christian art, there's a cruci the crucifix, and there's a skull at the bottom of the crucifix, right? That's, it's called the place of the skull, Golgotha. Did you know whose skull is at the bottom of that cross? Adam's. Okay. Beginning to organize our story, the Christian story, they would say, around this story, moving the pieces of Jerusalem around a little bit to create their own version. So a little drawing of that. Notice in this, here is a sixth century mosaic, very schematic map of Jerusalem with the main stichumenus, the, the, the east-west street. And um, this is the Holy Sepulchre here. And over here, this is the Dome of the Rock. Here's a, a, a little drawing of it. And you can see that they're opposite. They are facing each other across the main drag of Jerusalem. And even today, this is what an aerial view of this area is. Here's the, I'm sorry, Temple Mount, I'm saying Dome of the Rock, I should be saying Temple Mount, but here it is the Dome of the Rock now. Uh, here, this shrine, which is now, a, a, not a mosque, but it's a, it's a Muslim shrine, um, here, and then Holy Sepulcher is over here. Okay, so in a sense, they're still facing each other as if competing. One's larger than the other. But. Now, in Christian pilgrims begin to merge these things in their minds and their imaginations. In their imaginations. The fourth century pilgrim says, the date on which the church on Golgotha was consecrated to God is the very date on which the cross was discovered, and it is the very day in which Solomon consecrated his house to God. In the 6th century, it gets even more interesting. This pilgrim says, from the tomb, this is Christ's tomb, it is 80 paces to Golgotha, okay, where he was crucified. That makes sense. But then, you can see the place where Christ was crucified, and beside this is the altar of Abraham, where he intended to offer Isaac. Not only that, it's also where Melchizedek offered sacrifice. Okay, everything's rolling in. It's like a big magnet sucking it all to itself. And then, the city is set on the mountain, says this pilgrim. We don't, anonymous pilgrim. 
In the center is the Basilica of Constantine, the Holy Sepulchre. There is the horn which with, which, with which David was anointed, then Solomon. There Adam was formed. There Abraham offered his son Isaac as sacrifice. In the very place the Lord was crucified. In front of the tomb is the altar on which Zacharias was killed. Therefore, it's also the temple. And from there you go to the basilica, which is immediately next, where Jesus found people buying and selling doves and drove them out. So it's all become the temple. Everything that happened in Jesus' life story is now moved to the Holy Sepulchre, which we know was in a different part of Jerusalem. So here is the interior. This is the, a drawing of what that tomb of Jesus may have looked like inside that rotunda, where everything begins to happen. And then finally, if that weren't enough, um, turning the temple into a church and then turning the church into the temple, we start moving the temple around a little bit. St. Peter's in Rome, and the many, I know you, many of you have been there, and one of the most important images of the most memorable pieces of this are these beautiful bronze twisted columns that hold up the canopy over the high altar. Those bronze twisted columns, these are Bernini's columns, mind you, but they were copies of what was supposed to be the original columns that Constantine, or his son Constans, put in this basilica in the fourth century. Now, the historians of that are closest to the time that Constantine built this building, said Constantine brought these twisted columns from Greece. That's all it says. But by the 12th century, those columns, as everybody knows, had been in the Temple of Solomon. <laughs> and so we see these twisted columns as they may have looked in the 4th century on this um, ivory box that shows the interior of St. Peter's on one face. But then the artists begin to construct Solomon's temple to have these twisted columns. And so here is a wonderful illumination from a manuscript of Josephus' document, the Jewish Antiquity. It's done by a Christian illuminator in the 15th century, a very famous Christian illuminator. And we see that we show what it would have looked like inside the temple. And we see these twisted columns that also were in the temple, in the temple or the basilica of St. Peter's in Rome. Today, if you went to St. Peter's, there are eight of these twisted columns, um, the old ones, um, maybe as many as four that really could be from Constantine's era. And two of them are here. Right above, you can see just the edge of Bernini's column. And over here is a niche above a balcony with um, the elevated cross of Helena, Helena's true cross. Um, and these uh, columns, and there's one more set over there which has the veil of Veronica story. So these are reliquary balconies, and the Pope will come out with these relics at certain, uh, certain feasts. There's the one um, over there. And they're, those are almost certainly, for, more certainly fourth century. They're in much worse shape. And one of these was kept as a kind of, it's called the Colonna Sancta, because it was from the temple where Jesus would have been. This idea gets embroidered, and we end up with Raphael painting his cartoon for the tapestry of Christ healing the blind man in the temple, I mean, with those very columns. So the temple was moved, finally, or parts of it, to Rome. And Christians get very confused. Um, ultimately, there's a very famous, I'm going to end with this one, because it's a very famous quote, we don't even know if he said it, attributed to Justinian. When, at the dedication of the Basilica of Hagia Sophia, and in Constantinople, today Istanbul, in 537. And when Justinian, the Roman emperor, walked into this massive building that he had built, he is supposed to have said, Solomon, I have surpassed you. <laughs>